Hi, this is Lisa Vaz. I'm pleased to say that I'm one of the cybersecurity reporters for Cybersecurity Headlines. It's a news podcast that delivers the most important cybersecurity stories every weekday in about six minutes. Subscribe via your favorite podcast app or at CISOseries.com. What metrics or indicators signal to you that an organization is, quote, good at security? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series and guest co hosting with me today, who has been a former guest, is Jeff Belknap, the CISO of LinkedIn. Jeff, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. And hey, friends. Awesome. Well, by the way, I'm thrilled to have Jeff. We've had you on multiple times in the past, and I'm thrilled that we're going to be doing this together. Just remind everybody we're available at CISOseries.com. And well, everything that you would want to know about us, our other podcasts, our weekly video chats, all available there. So please check it out. I want to mention our sponsor today, Imperva. Very excited to have Imperva as part of the show. You're going to hear a little bit more about them in the middle of the show. But first, our topic today is determining how good you're at at security. And Jeff, this whole discussion we have is based on a post you put up on where you live is LinkedIn and where you work. I think LinkedIn is where I live practically too, how much time I spend on it. Set us up. What was the post? What were you looking for? Here's a topic that I know is on my mind all the time and that I think is on the mind of everybody who's in security and especially if you're in leadership. We constantly ask ourselves, how do we know if we're any good at what we do? And beyond that, how does our board know? How does our company leadership know? Do employees think the same way we think about this? Are we aligned? Are we way off? What is it you'd say you do here? So in the midst of an existential crisis like this, I did what anyone would do. I tossed it on LinkedIn. And I wanted to see how other people were thinking about it. And the conversation was pretty engaging. I thought it'd be a great topic for us to dive into a little bit more. And every time I'm going to dive into something a little bit more deeply and do some deep thinkery, I always reach out to my buddy, Justin Berman. So I invited him to join us today. Yes. And we've had Justin on multiple times before. So if you don't mind, I'm going to interrupt you and introduce him right now. He's the former CISO of Dropbox and an awesome guest, Justin Berman. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jeff. Super great to be here. How do we go about measuring the risk? Christian Hyatt of Risk360 said, quote, what is the risk assessment process and does it result in a security strategy that aligns security with business objectives? And Julian C. also said, quote, how the security team identifies and prioritizes risk, how the security team interfaces with internal and external parties it serves. So, A lot of this had to do with structure. We're going to talk more about that later as well. But it was really about, are you actually looking at this as a risk job? And can you, again, going back to your original question, Jeff, determine how good you are at security in terms of how well you're looking at risk? Yeah, I think think when I looked at what most people's answers were to this, it was broken into a bunch of categories. And one of the main categories, and one that's close to my heart, was how are you doing at managing your risk? And I think Justin and I's buddy Julian here had an interesting approach to this, which is how does the security team identify and prioritize risk, right? And I think this is indeed one of the things that I identify with as being something that means I'm good at what I do is, am I identifying risks? Am I identifying risks that matter to the company and that are actually going to have an impact to the company? Or am I just finding everything that could possibly go wrong? Justin, how do you think about this? I want to add a point to what you're saying, which is that I think it's really important that security teams start seeing themselves the same way other risk teams see themselves, which is not necessarily to be responsible for deciding how big an impact is for the organization, but rather working together to bring the org together on what a risk is. So just to really quickly, what I mean here is by way of example is if you're talking about losing money as a result of something, whether it's a a breach or fraud or accidents or waste or anything else, it's not the security team that should say, this is how big a single loss event is. Really your finance team or some combination of people within the org should say that. And then the security team can use that as an input, which 
I think is a much faster way of getting to the answer to the thing you said before, Jeff, which is like, am I actually identifying risk that matters to the business? But I'm going to bring this back, though, to Jeff's original question of all this I agree with, but how does any indicator of this and like maybe you could just tell me a good indicator that we're doing well is that we're measuring risk like this and a bad indicator is we're doing it like this. I mean, is there a way you can describe that, Jeff? Yeah, I think subjectively it really comes down to this feeling that if the org feels like, again, just very subjectively, that the risk you're identifying is a valuable thing to be discussing, I think you're on the right path. Now, that's pretty far away from an objective measure of like whether you're good at this or not. But I think it's the very beginning of the path to understanding that your job is to enable the business to grow and thrive and be successful. Your job is not to make sure that the business never runs into a risky position. I might say it slightly different, Jeff, which is I think your job is to, I agree with the grow and thrive part, but also to make accurate decisions, or at least as accurate as we can possibly make. You want to make risk conscious in their mind as opposed to a thing that they implicitly accept so that when they do make a decision to accept risk or to take risks, let's say it that way, that it's knowing what that means as opposed to accidentally taking risk on that they didn't mean to. So I like what you just said there, that a clear understanding by everyone when we're taking on risk, when we're dealing with it, is potentially a good indicator that we're doing our job well. That if like kind of everyone's on the same page. Jeff? Yeah, I think the key is to be influential in the decision about that risk and to make sure that you don't feel like you own the decision to take that risk or not, but you're well informing everyone who needs to make that decision. Can there ever be agreement on this? Greg McVeary of Southern Connecticut State University said, the org chart, the headcount, and budget. If you can't even tell me who is in charge of compliance, who is in charge of security, and how much you spend a year, dot, dot, dot. And then Troy Fine of Schneider Down said, quote, reporting lines are a huge indicator. If the head of security reports to the CIO slash director of IT, this most likely indicates that the head of security will not have the right budget allocated and will not have a straight line to the C-suite. So they're all about, does everyone understand what their job is, what their responsibility is, which I got to assume is right for kind of any role, security or not. But is there a lot of confusion in companies as to what security's role is, Justin? Uh, I definitely think that I've seen companies fall into kind of three main buckets. One is security is something we have to have because other people tell us we have to have it, whether it's customers or regulators. One is security is something we have and we don't really know why we have it, which is I think where honestly a lot of companies fall. They have heard that security is a big deal, but don't know what to do with it. And the last is security is something we've thought hard about and understand the value it presents to the business and or believe the value is high. You know, what's interesting about what Troy said in particular about reporting lines as opposed to job responsibilities is that I don't actually think that the CIO is the problem or that the head of IT is the problem or anything else. I think the problem is not having the right reporting line. You can report to anyone in the business as long as they can provide you the influence you need to help affect change. You can report to someone who is influential and they still don't actually care or really want the security responsibility. And so like, I don't actually think reporting lines are as big an indicator as people might think at least not the on the book cover of that reporting line. It's really, you have to dig deeper. We did a whole other episode of who should the CISO report to, and there was lots and lots of debate on just that very subject. Let me throw this over to you, Jeff, because this section and these quotes is very akin to what we talked in the last segment about risk. But what Justin said is similar to what you said in terms of, do you have the influence to be able to do your job, which... I guess reporting lines does matter here. Yes, Jeff, or no? I think Justin is on to something, and I think Troy really starts us down the right discussion path here. As a gross indicator of the way an organization is thinking about the security, reporting line really matters. Now, it doesn't matter as much, just to Justin's point, it doesn't matter as much whether it's the CIO or somebody else. It really matters, like, what's that structural influence in the organization? And this is where it stops being a gross tool. You can't really look from the outside in and decide whether you're reporting into the right spot. 
But a company knows and a CEO knows or a board knows whether the position that a CISO is in or any security leader really is going to lead to the right influence that's going to inform decisions or influence risk. And if you're, let's just take a very stereotypical example. If you're reporting to the CIO, you've got a problem where you might not be influencing risk because the CIO doesn't own risk in an organization and is not typically a place senior executives or the board goes to understand risk across the entire organization. Now, maybe in some companies that is, right? And I'm sure there are places where CIOs are well involved in risk, especially in financial services. But this isn't a great place to start. I've reported to CTOs, I've reported to CEOs, and frankly, there's no silver bullet here, right? It really just matters how much influence you have in the organization and how much that, uh, to Justin's point, how much that leader you're reporting to cares, right? If they don't care, and I mean this in a uh, in a gross sense, not a nuanced sense, but if they're not engaged in in how risk is operated in the organization, well, it's an uphill battle for you. And anytime the CISO is in a position where they've got to fight their way into every discussion, they're losing. That's a really good point. And that would be a sign of doing security bad. So maybe some advice for the people who are managing the CISOs, whoever that may be, whatever that reporting structure is, what would they be doing in their role to make security win, to make security look like they're doing a good job at their job? What can they do to enable the security team? I think from my perspective, it really is what decides whether someone's going to have the appropriate voice and be at the right table for the discussions when we're talking about things that are going to influence change in the culture or things that are going to make uh, systemic change in the organization. And if that means you have to report to the CEO or the CTO to get it, then you have to do that. But if those conversations can be had structurally and constructively at any level, then just let them be had, but make sure the CISO is at that table. With the continued dramatic changes in digital transformation, including modernization of applications and data moving to the cloud and to hybrid environments, it remains a huge challenge for information security teams and for the broader organization to truly understand activity flowing through their applications. That's where Imperva comes in. Matt Hathaway is their VP of Product Marketing and he knows all about the challenges of tracking that activity as it flows through the company's applications. These historically siloed teams, we're unifying our security expertise across these modern applications built in the cloud, uh, hybrid infrastructure, and data really everywhere. Um, data doesn't just live in your organization anymore. It's not just in your data center or in one cloud. It could be multi-cloud. And being able to give that deep visibility into what traffic is suspicious, um, what's unusual and looks like possibly a compromised user accessing your databases. Tying that together has is, is just been historically challenging for organizations. They've been challenged to do it in their SIM. We work very well and add context to a SIM, but still lots of times when you start to investigate deeper um, into what it really occurred prior to you know the incident response team getting an alert, it becomes somewhat of a, a black box to trace it back to the beginning. And that's that's a lot of what Imperva is adding. For more information, visit Imperva, I-M-P-E-R-V-A dot com. How do we handle this? Stian Maristad of Mnemonic said, quote, how well they train and keep their employees up to date on cybersecurity awareness, culture, skills, etc. The readiness and abilities to detect and respond to incidents, how balanced their cybersecurity budget is, effectiveness in detecting, managing, and fixing vulnerabilities, how well they manage and monitor identity. So Stian gave us a nice laundry list there. And Charles Chibuese of Deloitte said, Ratio of number of critical slash high severity issues found to the number of critical slash high severity issues closed. And lastly, Mike Zussman of Carve Systems said, how well the non-security IT engineering staff understands the threats their organization is facing. So in these first two quotes, Justin, I'm going to go to you first here. They're very much things we could actually measure in terms of determining how good we are in security. The other two segments we talked about were not, I guess, as easily measurable. And this last quote, maybe not as easy to measure as well. Would you be measuring these things to show, show essentially senior management and the board that security is on the right path? Because they do want to see some metrics, right? Right. I like measuring quantitative things that I can show a relationship, a clear relationship 
back to actual risk outcomes to take that through and to end. Vulnerability management is a thing that I actually really like measuring. I measure it for two reasons. One, as we can see from actual breaches that actually happen, vulnerability management is key to do well in order to decrease the likelihood of future breach. And second, what I've noticed is things that you can measure and place a clear goal around are things that other senior executives can motivate or are motivated to align to fix. If you can measure something, then you can set a specific target. If you can set a specific target, then people can achieve that target. That makes them look good. Then they win. You win together. All right, Jeff, add to that as well. Yeah, I think you know the, the old adage of what gets measured gets managed is definitely true in security. And I think the place to start is really by looking at the things you can measure, because certainly there are a lot of things in security you cannot measure. And there were some discussions in the LinkedIn post about you know, things we wish we could measure, like attacks that didn't happen or when things like that. But if you are looking at the things to Justin's point that you can measure and your metrics are not, uh, you're not proud of those metrics, like that's a great place to start. I think once you get past that, once all those metrics, those standard things you can measure are sort of stable and you understand how they're trending, then it really gets to that philosophical discussion where, where Justin and I were, were starting with this uh, LinkedIn post. It's like, how do we know we're good at this? Because so much of security is stuff that you just can't measure. And I wonder, Justin, if you had to pick like one thing you wish you could measure, what do you think that would be? If I had to pick one thing I could measure... I don't know if this counts, Jeff, so forgive me if I'm going outside the bound, but like what I'd really like is a list of the adversaries that care about me and how they're going to target me so that I can then, then I want to simulate all those things and measure whether my controls actually stop them. To what level does threat intelligence do that for you already? That feels like a way to argue about threat intelligence companies right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder, I just wondering to what level. I think that you can get something out of that, but I do not think you will easily get the accurate granular specifics that allow you to have a red team simulate those behaviors. Yeah, I think I think I'm on the same line. I think, you know, threat intelligence is fine and I think it it certainly has a lot of value in in any program, any mature program. What I think I would like uh, is definitely along the lines of what Justin's thinking about is a, sort of an inverse NPS for all of my threat actors. How mad has one threat actor gotten at me versus the other? Because, man, I'm doing a great job if the human on the other side of the keyboard is frustrated. Who are the winners and losers? Mark McCourt of Viaku said, quote, if the policy is to have a reactive posture and respond to events, and security does, then their metrics will be positive. If the policy is to be proactive, and they invest in that posture to identify threats and eliminate vulnerabilities, then the metric would be based on threat mitigation. And then lastly, Pulin Thakar of IBN said, what is secure for one organization could not be the case for another organization. So throwing this to you first, Jeff, this is about structure of organizations and how they approach security. So let me ask, have you worked at organizations that have a very different viewpoint of how they approach security? And as a result, you would have had to sort of measure your success differently as a result. Oh, yeah. I think everybody thinks about what their security outcome is differently. And I think both of these quotes get to the real heart of the matter if you abstract them out. What are we really playing towards? What's the outcome security is driving towards? And I think Mark is probably um, pretty close to my heart in terms of thinking about, you know, is our policy here to be reactive and respond to everything? Or are we really trying to like drive the business forward and think about what are we doing in security to make sure that the business wins? All right, Justin, how about you in terms of do your viewpoints of how to measure security change company to company, or do you try to bring your philosophy with everyone and try to bring everyone on board with you. I definitely think it's different company to company. And like what I would say is that my philosophy means I'm only a fit for working at certain organizations. Uh, some organizations, frankly, maybe this will make the security community mad to hear, but like some companies don't need that much security and they don't need to have a strong proactive stance because security is just not core to their market offering or the risks that their business faces. Yeah. I mean, industry to industry, that would change. Sure. I think I would extend on that and go, 
like many things, you can invest and you only need to invest so much. Some organizations just don't need to be the world's best at some sort of advanced threat detection and response, right? And I and I think some people certainly miss that. And I think they mistakenly, when they miss that, interpret it as this organization doesn't care about its members, customers, or business. And the reality is what they really care about is their members or customers, but they understand what level of security they need to provide to build that foundation of trust with that constituency. I think that's right. I think one of the challenges though, Jeff, is that a lot of companies that I've seen the ones that know they don't need it tend to be right. And the ones that don't know they need it tend to be in that mode until suddenly they realize because they can't land a deal and then you have a lot of debt to pay down. So I think that there's like this challenge where we are usually asked to come in and explain to the company not just how to manage the risk, but why they need to manage their risk more proactively or why why they need a more serious program that's like almost uh, aligned to the cultural change thing that I see CISOs asked to do. Yeah, I think you I think you're dead on. I think it's really easy for companies to we'll say underestimate the amount of security that they need and it's really hard for companies to accurately understand where their program currently is at. You know, if we were accountants or lawyers, I think it's fairly straightforward to understand the maturity of your program and what's appropriate, but the reality is like we talked about before, so much of security is this subjective, you know, things we don't really know and problems we don't know enough about. So as as I'm hearing, a lot of the measurement also relies on your trust with the senior leadership that you're going in the right direction. And you try to prove that with what metrics you have and the stories you can tell, and also sort of agreement in the ability to do your jobs from their ability to determine risk appetite to you being able to sort of squash the risk. Did I sort of sum that up decently enough? Yeah. I think a major part of your ability to succeed in your role as a, as a senior security leader is being able to convince the rest of the executive team that you are one of them. Let's close on that. Excellent. All right. Now, before I let either one of you go, I want you to tell me what your favorite quote was from our discussion. And I'm going to go with you, Jeff, if you have a favorite quote, because you did call somebody out already. Let me know if that is it or something else. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to go with uh, with good old Julian here. I think how you identify and prioritize risk is, is really essential. And I think Julian always does a great job of, of nailing that on the head. Excellent. And Justin, your favorite quote and why? Uh, I would have gone for the same area. Christian Hyatt's quote, I think, is equally good, particularly because that like internal business alignment seems so critical to me from every place I've ever been that if you can't accurately align the risks that matter to the business and then solve them or help the company decide how to solve them, then I think your program is destined to fail. Well, and I think that's why we put it up first because while everything else is nice, if that foundation doesn't exist, you're kind of just spinning wheels, possibly. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I want to thank you again, Justin. I'm going to let you have the very last word here. But uh, first, I want to thank our sponsor, Imperva. If you're in the world of application or interested in application security solutions, take a look at what they've got over at imperva.com. And uh, Jeff, thank you for coming in as the guest co-host here. I'm hoping that we can do this again some more. You're awesome. Thank you so much. And also, thank you so much for putting out such a great discussion on LinkedIn. I mean, this show is based on what gets people sort of riled up and passionate. And, and I essentially look for great discussions on LinkedIn for just that reason. So I appreciate you setting that up. Anyway, any last thoughts, any last uh, comments for the audience? I'm always excited when we can make hay with my insecurities uh, about my job. But thanks for having me. I think it's great. Uh, and I'll just leave a thought of, uh, if you haven't turned on 2FA for your accounts, turn it on. It's quick. It's easy. It makes the bad guys mad. I just turned it on 2FA for LinkedIn myself because it was required if I wanted to do streaming. Uh-huh. See? Which I was like, I want to do streaming, so I guess I got to turn it on. And I didn't even know it was even a bit. This is the thing. I didn't even know it was available. So I was like, ah. It's available. It's great. free. We have multiple versions of it. It's great. Turn it on. Free, as, as my dad would say, better than half off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Justin, thank you again for coming on again. Any last thoughts? And are you on the market now, by the way? I am on the market now, but I don't have any special thoughts. Uh, I'll agree with Jeff. Turn on, turn on 2FA everywhere. He cares about yes. LinkedIn, and I just want all of you to be safe. Turn on 2FA <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Good point. I also want everyone to be safe. <laughs> we all, that it's kind of your job, right? Everyone but you, David. I know I want them to be safe. 
<laughs> thank you so much for having me, though. Justin, thank you again. Jeff, thank you so much. And to the audience, thank you for all your awesome contributions. We greatly appreciate it. And we even more so appreciate you listening. And if you want to, tell all your friends about this show. Write a review. We appreciate all that as well. Thank you. You've been listening to Defense In Depth. We've reached the end of Defense In Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth.